morning and welcome to the development track. Uh, my name is Matt Close with Wagner Rents. At Wagner, we believe our employees are our greatest asset. We pride ourselves in providing a great employee benefits program, challenging career opportunities, uh, training and tools to grow a career <clears throat> and leadership that creates a great place to work. Uh, Joseph Wagner founded Wagner Equipment Company in 1976 and his leadership not only at Wagner, but in many communities, uh, community groups for business hall of fame. Uh, Mr. Wagner passed away at the age of 92 in 2018, but his leadership left a legacy. Um, I tell you this because leaders grow leaders and the result is opportunity for a business community to thrive and continue in that leadership tradition. Leaders are just not people who sit at the top of the organization, but include the go-to person, the job site, uh, folks who, who go to to problem solve. Um, and the stories that demands our attention. Um, where do your heads turn for answers to start the discussion? We are all leaders in one way or another. Let me take one step further. You are a leader. You are a coach. How do you motivate and encourage others to reach and surpass their goals? Um, you can do just that, but do you have the skills? Uh, leaders have a critical role in motivating, motivating employees to surpass goals. The most important uh, is to coach effectively and holds everyone accountable in a constructive way. Great coaching retains talent and inspires people to stretch beyond their current capabilities. This presentation will provide pointers on effective coaching to reinforce exceptional performance with guidance for those difficult conversations when employees are stepping up. Uh, Audrey is a human resources leader, currently a senior HR consultant with BVSI. She has managed HR field operations teams from site throughout the country. Uh, she's a dynamic results oriented leader. Audrey's passion in working with organizations that experience continuous change. Um, Audrey, if you can hear us, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. 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 Hang on just a second. Here. I'm having technical problems. It's for pure torture. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to, I can't hear you. So this is my feeling totally alone. Uh, here's the thing I, I'd like everyone to do is if they have questions, please post those on the chat. I'm going to talk to you about coaching. Um, I decided I'm just going to wing it with the technical difficulties and we're going to make sure this works. Okay. Um, can you, you can all see my presentation here. What we're going to talk about today is the whole idea of coaching from the standpoint of, of making sure that you maximize the performance of people uh, far beyond what they thought is possible, and even for you too. So let's talk about why coaching has so much potential for people. And, and, and I'd like to also say that, you know, we talk a lot about turnover. We talked about turnover yesterday. You know, uh, besides pay, the biggest reason that people leave companies is because of the relationship with their managers. And so if you think about the manager that you had that didn't really inspire you, you'll find that the one absent element in that relationship was they didn't really coach you. They just directed you, they barked orders, they maybe didn't communicate effectively with you, but they didn't really take the time and energy to build that relationship based on trust. So today we're going to talk about that essential tool to great leadership, which is. So the question is, why coach? Well, uh, you know, it's it's really a, 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 a important activity for a manager to do and even as time constraint managers often can be where you're proactively building trust in your relationship with people um, you know if if you're a good coach uh, you'll see that you know in the day-to-day -day actions you can predict some future performance if you see the employee behaving the same way making the same action every day uh, it won't change until you tell them something needs to change and that's one of the biggest misses that a lot of supervisors may have and fully understand that if someone is making a mistake, they should let the employee know what's wrong and how to make it right. Much earlier than many of them do, but many stop doing that because of a fear of conflict. These are missed opportunities, and if you miss that opportunity, chances are if you tell the employee six months later they made that mistake, uh, what happens is trust is broken. It can either be diminished somewhat or broken altogether, where the employee gets the sense that you're really not as interested in and their relationship with you as they thought you were. So it's a very disappointing experience. Well, what happens with lost trust? Well, um, you know, it's according to Dr. Leonard Nadler, 
Um, the relationship between the employee and their immediate supervisor is the single most influential factor in determining how long employees will stay. So that relationship is so important. So as I said before, employees leave supervisors, not companies more often than not. So why coach? Well, the number one reason is that um, it really reinforces positive behaviors, um, the kinds of behaviors that uh, help people um, understand what they're supposed to do. Uh, it, it, you, you speak to them on their, their terms, their level of understanding, and you reinforce if you can if you really recognize the good performance and they'll repeat it. It's you know people are they are hungry for positive reinforcement. If you ask yourself today, do I get enough positive reinforcement? Chances are probably not. Well, your employees are just as hungry. It directly impacts performance. Um, you know if you, if you if you do get a chance to coach, you're motivating people to perform to a higher standard than they than they expected or you as well. So you're taking the time to help them be better employees. Uh, and it redirects negative behavior. So coaching is not bonking someone on the head and saying you did it wrong. Coaching is a very patient process where you have to think through what is it going to take for this employee to really embrace the idea that what they did was a mistake and they need to change their behavior. And this is really hard for situations where the negative behaviors are interpersonal in nature, like not getting along with people, saying things the wrong way. You know, it's not going to help for you to say, stop doing that like a parent. It's really more important to try coaching because it does redirect those negative behaviors. And it also ensures some real positive business relationships. In other words, uh, you know, you're demonstrating to the employee the desire for them to be successful. And they, in turn, will, will model those behaviors with others. So you're really ensuring you're, you're demonstrating some a real positive approach to managing this relationship. And it increases a great deal of job satisfaction. You know, people feel uh, that when a manager takes the time to coach them, they will uh, embrace that idea of wanting to grow, especially your younger workers. As I mentioned yesterday, many of these younger workers demand that kind of relationship based on trust. And so, you know, if you do take the time to coach, uh, you actually find that people feel much more satisfied with what they're getting uh, in terms of the relationship with their supervisor than they realize. And the final thing, and this is the most important thing for coaching, is that it builds trust. It, it's the one thing that uh, is a, a missed opportunity for managers who don't take the time to do it. But for those who do take the time to sit back and let the employee process, you know, whatever is happening in a way that's on their terms, makes a huge difference to them such that they see you with a greater level of respect. There are also the economic reasons to consider when it comes to coaching. Um, you know, a coaching can in, ensure that you have, you know, if you have better relationships with your employees, they'll have better relationships with your customers. It'll retain your customers and your employees when you have you take the time to coach. Um, you can also reduce the turnover costs. As I mentioned yesterday, if you weren't on, on the session there, you know, turnover is extremely expensive. It's almost to the point where you have to ask yourself fundamental questions if your turnover is so high that the continuous churn is preventing you from getting the work done, uh, those turnover costs have to be considered, which lays all the more reason why you have to be a better coach uh, versus just telling people what to do. Also, the labor shortage, you know, if you if you lose someone because uh, of a, a disappointing uh, experience an employee may have with the company, it's going to take you a little longer to find a good person, and it's also going to take time to get them onboarded and trained as well. And of course, the legal liabilities, if people feel that the company doesn't care about them, uh, there's a higher likelihood if they feel they've been ripped off, uh, treated poorly, they may go to uh, enforcing agencies or file some claims against companies. And typically, when that happens, it's because the employee is angry with the supervisor or the company for not treating them with respect. So those are some additional things you have to be careful with. But I can tell you that if you take the time to coaching, you can bring it to some great performance. So I talked about, you know, what it caught, what, how important customer retention is. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, the customer cost could be um, your referrals, you, you know, some um, uh, networking that you do with customers. And then also, um, you also ask yourself uh, who comes first. And then this is really a chicken and egg conversation, which is more important when it comes to a successful organization. 
without the employee, you can't really serve the customer. And without the customer, the employee has no job. So what a dilemma. So I think the thing you have to understand here is that you know, a successful, happy employee is really what's going to drive that, that customer retention. It's also um, cheaper, you know, like I said, to retain that experienced employees uh, than to recruit and, and, and hire. And, you know, I talked about the cost of turnover earlier where it's quite significant. In fact, yesterday I talked about a formula where you calculate the average pay times uh, a percent depending on skill, which ends up being a dollar amount, which is quite uh, amazing when you think about it, if you have a lot of turnover. Other economic reasons. Well, there's some solutions to this. Well, you can develop a retention strategy. Uh, one of the first things I would do if I was just getting a sense of how employees are feeling about the company and where to start is I would do exit interviews. I would ask employees how they felt about the work environment, uh, you know, how they felt about working with the supervisor, the training and development discussions to really get a sense of what's driving that kind of uh, exit. And you can actually proactively uh, fix some problems that are that you might think are fairly minor, but are big enough for people are leading. So those are things to think about as well, like training managers on how to coach better. Uh, you should have a recruitment strategy. In fact, this afternoon, Sarah Jorgens is going to speak about that in some length as well. Um, and then you can also develop a succession plan. And this is one of the things that most organizations don't want to do or have trouble doing. That is, who would be the next person stepping into key positions? And it doesn't have to be just, just leadership positions. It could be a position that where it requires a high degree of skill and experience where this person is going to take a long time uh, to be fully trained, the replacement. So, you, you know, you could have a succession plan that helps you have a pipeline of people that are ready to grow into new roles. And, and that's where the career development comes into, into play. Um, you can develop some apprenticeship programs. Uh, where people can grow into, uh, with no experience to have the skills that are needed. And also, you know, some of the solutions are going to be thinking outside the box, which would mean you might need some flexible work arrangements, some job sharing. Um, you might even think about work-life balance. And these are things that are important to a lot of your workers. So if you're thinking, that's just crazy, there's no way that's going to work for me. Well, it's front of mind for a lot of employees nowadays and a lot of your applicants that they want these things. Uh, but if it's not possible, that's okay. It's just, the point is, think outside the box. Don't think about the way, uh, you know, things have been and that it always works. You may need to think of new ways to retain your folks. And then, of course, uh, having management development training. Um, that's one of the things that seem like it's impossible to do. But uh, we have, you know, lots of ways uh, at BBSI to show managers where they can build a leadership development program that's easy to use. It's not expensive. Um, and really all it takes is having a mentor for these people, having a training and development plan, um, having resources there for the employee to learn, uh, giving them some special projects that put them in leadership roles. Those are all ingredients to a great management training program where an employee goes through a, a six to 12 month journey to be ready to be a leader. And also if you have any kind of educational reimbursement, that may help you too when you think of low skill where you're, you're providing employees the opportunity to go to school to get uh, the certificates or the degrees that are needed for the job. So now I'm going to move on to reasons, you know, some things, you know, what, what's holding managers back from coaching. Well, um, I would say that the biggest reason that I see, having been in HR for about 38 years, is that, you know, whenever managers feel they have to coach, it's usually for a mistake or something that went wrong, and, and they just don't want to talk to the employee about it. They're afraid the employee is going to get mad, that there'll be conflict. And, and they're just not sure that that's the best course of action. So what do we do? We avoid. So it's, it's it, it, they just don't want to talk to the employee about issues. In some cases, the workspace may be wide open where there isn't a place for the employee and manager to speak confidentially about if there's an error or a problem that needs to be changed, uh, behavior that needs to be changed. There's no place to go. You can't tell the employee, hey, you stop being late out there. I'm, I'm getting sick and tired of it in front of your whole group. That's just not the right way to do it. Uh, the other thing that supervisors say is I just don't really have time to coach people. You know, coaching takes a lot of time uh, to get done because you have to be patient. you got to sit through asking people questions to get to flaws in thinking. Um, and you know, supervisors are just so busy, they just don't have the time to sit down and have a conversation like that. Um, sometimes supervisors may have a personal relationship with the employee, and it's really hard if the employee is making an error, has a behavioral issue, um, you know, to say, hey, you know, we got to talk about this. I'm your supervisor, and I'm going to take off my friendship hat. 
and talk to you about this. And, and many supervisors tend to be hesitant to confront people when there's an issue for that reason. Um, and many supervisors just don't know how to coach. I mean, their idea of coaching might be watching a sports event where the coach is yelling at the players, yelling at the referees, but there really isn't an, there isn't a real um, way, effective way for them to coach. They just haven't been trained on how to do it. And the biggest thing that that they that makes them hesitant is they're really afraid that they're going to do it wrong. So if I have to talk to an employee about something they did wrong, what if they get mad? Oh my goodness, what is going to happen? And that prevents them from talking to these, these employees who need to have um, some changes done. I would say, though, no excuses. Um, you know, you can, you can have lots of ways to help, uh, some tools to help employees uh, better get a sense of what's expected out of them. You could do job descriptions. If you haven't done job descriptions yet, they're, you know, there's, they're all out there on the Internet. If you want to get some, we have a library of them that we'd be happy to share with you. And this allows, you know, if you have a job description, this allows managers and employees to identify what the essential responsibilities are and what the performance criteria could be. It's a place to start. And if you have a new employee, you could sit down and walk with them through the job description to say, here are the responsibilities. Now, I understand that, you know, job descriptions get outdated fairly quickly. However, uh, you know, they're, they're good tools for training and development, it's a, and, and it gives people a sense of what's expected. You could develop some policies and procedures uh, that could be on how to handle progressive disciplinary action if someone isn't doing a, a good job. But I would say that you do not want to do a three strikes and you're out policy where you, if you do something wrong three times, you're out of here because those types of policies have gotten companies in big trouble over wrongful termination lawsuits where maybe one supervisor is following the rules and another one breaks them, which means that uh, you'll end up um, getting sued by the employee for not following your own rules. So you, know, you don't want to have a, a specific policy that explains exactly how you're going to discipline someone. But you do want to say, we do have a process in place that will, usually it's a verbal warning. It might be a written warning or two, uh, and then it might be termination. But you want to have a, a process that managers understand. What will help, too, is having an employee handbook, which will uh, allow the employee to better understand what is expected from a policy perspective. It gives you support from a documentation perspective as well, where many agencies, the first thing they ask for if an employee files a complaint against a company is, do you have a signed handbook acknowledgement form? Because if you don't, the employee, they assume the employee does not know what the policy is. And I actually had this happen at a restaurant where the employee, the manager did not pass out the handbook, which said stealing is wrong. Okay, this is wild, but true. And the uh, an employee was um, scammed out of uh, giving uh, some person fifteen hundred dollars in gift cards out of the cash uh, the cashier cash register, and and so you know basically was, she was terminated for failing to follow the policies. And what happened was she won unemployment because she didn't sign an employee handbook acknowledgement form that said she understood what the policy was. Now, to me, that sounds crazy. If it's not ethical, you should be fired. But in the case of the state of Colorado, if you don't have a handbook acknowledgement that says, I know that, you know, I'm not supposed to do these things, uh, then you could end up having to pay unemployment or, or worse, have some claims put against the company. So a handbook is becoming all the more important nowadays for employees to better understand what's expected. The other thing is in the structure, you may want to develop some feedback mechanisms such as performance evaluations, a, a quarterly discussion, talking to the employee about how they're doing. It's more proactive where you talk about how they're doing versus how you think they're doing. Um, for new employees, I would advise you have uh, at least a 90-day discussion with them on how they're doing. Usually employees at that time are fairly nervous about whether or not they're doing a good job. They're still learning. So uh, having feedback uh, provided to them will give them a lot of comfort. Um, you should also see if you can measure performance in any way with um, any kind of uh, tracking mechanism that you have. Um, and, and again, I would utilize the job description when talking about performance. And then you want to, as a, as a matter of process, develop a, a disciplinary action process, which means that you, you as managers would talk about what is expected of people, what do you do if they're not meeting expectation. And the gold standard would be you give people a chance. You give people a chance to do a good work, but if they choose not to, then you hold them accountable. So that might mean I coach them, and then I, if they don't listen to me, they still the wrong, they, they still do the, the wrong behavior. I give them a verbal warning, which all it is is say, hey, listen, you're doing this wrong, and if you continue to do this wrong, further disciplinary action could occur, up to and including termination. 
And then I might do a written warning. I think one written warning is good enough, uh, but every company is a little bit different. Uh, but you should have minimally one where you say, here's the issue. I told you about it on this day. Uh, you chose not to follow the direction. It's still an issue. It needs to change. Now I'm putting this in writing. Do you understand further disciplinary action could occur up to and including termination? So the next time it could be termination. Um, so having that process in place, it seems makes it less daunting for managers to walk through really difficult situations. You know, when a manager manages these situations without tools, performance management ends up being based on a manager's perception based on fact or an either a perceptions by the employee. So if there's no structure, then it is a conflict or it might be avoidance of talking to the employee about the issues. But then you're dealing with someone who's not meeting expectations. And it goes on forever, which could be torment. So the workforce tools, coaching tools that you have, as I mentioned, are job descriptions, policies, performance feedback, and progressive discipline. So demographics, I think you need to know who you're dealing with. All right. So your workforce is uh, a group of people, the boomers. You know, we're all, and I'm a boomer by myself, myself, not by myself, but myself. And uh, these are workers that have been uh, born from 1946 to 1965. Uh, many of them are on their way to retirement now. Um, you know, so you're seeing a lot of the knowledge that these people have had for years um, go away. That's one problem. Uh, the second issue is that, um, uh, you know, they, they, they're not sharing their knowledge with people. So and once they leave, you're left with a gap, a skills gap. So you don't have and many companies don't have a plan on how to make sure that knowledge is transferred. So that's those things to think about. The other piece is Generation X. So Generation X is, is from 1966 to 1980. And these people are very similar to baby boomers and that they're very loyal. Um, you know, they, they, they weren't exposed to the high technology that we have today. Um, so uh, not much different. But, you know, again, uh, these people are uh, they're now middle aged, late middle aged, uh, moving closer to baby boomer age uh, eventually. <laughs> And then, of course, you got the millennial generation, which is the largest population in the, in the country today. Uh, this is uh, from 1980 to 1995. Uh, these people are um, they are very different from the last two generations in that they fully expect to be treated uh, very differently from the, the previous generations is that they're, they're kind of free agents with their jobs where they just job hop every three years. They don't really care if you if, if you have much to offer, if you don't give them what they want, they'll leave. Uh, and this was true before the the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we were having some really serious issues with retention uh, in here in Colorado, where the unemployment rate was around 3%, 3.8. And so part of it was these millennial workers have very strong opinions about how work should be. They were exposed by their parents to perpetual layoffs in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, where you know they got to see their parents literally thrown away by their company uh, and, and so they realized, well, you know, loyalty doesn't pay off at all. So I'm going to I'm just going to take care of myself. Uh, so what drives them a lot is money, you know, so pay. They expect pay. They expect uh, career paths where they can move up in the company. They expect regular feedback, not just once a year, but, you know, weekly, monthly. But they expect feedback and they want to give you feedback and they want to have fun. I mean, that's really important. They want to have fun. And then, of course, you've got the Gen Zs. These are the folks that are digital natives. Um, they've been in the world of the Internet, the cell phone, all those uh, technology tools that we have for years since they were born. Uh, they communicate differently from the older generations in that their primary mode of communication that they're comfortable with is texting. Uh, talking on the phone seems crazy. Um, these people are uh, just entering the workforce and are, are pretty much like the millennial generation in that they don't feel any loyalty toward any one company. They do expect to have a fun workplace with lots of time off. Uh, they want to be able to have flexible time. Um, they're just they don't really they don't really feel the uh, obligation to remain employed with one company beyond three years, just like the millennials. So that's those are the populations that you're dealing with. All right. And, and you, you, the, the problem with all these different generations is that you have to manage them all differently. So for the, for the Gen X and, and, and uh, baby boomers, you might not need to give them the, the, the feedback 
with the frequency that you do with the with the millennials and Gen Zers. You might want to communicate differently with your older workers and that they're fine with talking on the phone or meeting with you in person, not so much with the younger workers, but you've got to get tuned in to how people like to communicate because one size will not fit. You know, if you try to email your uh, Gen Zer with a long email, they're going to zone out on you because, especially if you're coaching them for a performance issue, they're just not going to care because that's not how they communicate to you. So those are things you've got to watch out for as you're communicating. All these generational dynamics have impact on um, how you manage the business, which includes all these four categories here. And so it's really challenging to be a supervisor today. If you don't fully understand all the dynamics of these generations, it's, it's really tough because one, you don't know how to communicate to each uh, generation. And two, when you do, you're not sure if it's really a positive message. So it, you're gonna have to learn as a supervisor how to be very fluid and adaptive to these different generations. And I'll also be grounded in knowing what the policies are what the laws are and, and get plenty of training. So I'm going to give you some coaching guidelines because I think coaching is the lifeblood of good performance relationships, performance based relationships. Uh, and, and it's important that, you know, when you do coaching that you do it immediately. So if I've made a mistake, I, I hope that you talk to me about it. There's nothing wrong with doing it. In fact, you know, my um, I studied quite extensively conflict management in my graduate work and found that um, all of us are really bad at conflict. Um, we've been all trained to avoid pretty much through our parents and just in society in general. And so, you know, if, if we make a mistake, there's always that, uh, I'm not sure if I want to do that because what happens if they get mad, you know, or they don't like what I say? Well, the fact is, if you tell someone that they made an error early on, it's so much easier to solve. I mean, you don't have to wait till you're frustrated six months later. Um, you know, you can make it spontaneous. You don't have to have a planned meeting where you're sitting down with them and say, I have an issue with you. It could be, you know, you sit down with them in a private spot and say, hey, can I talk to you? Because then you remember everything. You know, if it was an error or a mistake, you remember what happened. So it's the most effective when you talk about the situation as soon as soon as possible and and the employee will appreciate that you have when you have an issue you're going to talk to them about it it makes sense to them um, and coaching is specific and and being specific means i i think saying you have a bad attitude is not specific and if anything it's really hard for someone to know what to do with that phrase you have a bad attitude is it my personality it can't be that i mean because i'm just a bubbly personality you can't not like that but that's where people go is they don't really know how to understand, you know, what the issue is. So you have to identify exactly what uh, is done well or needs improvement. And you don't have to sandwich, you know, you're a great butt because we all know that doesn't work very well. But be honest, you know, if I did something wrong, you say to me, here's what happened from what my, my perspective and here's here's what I see it going wrong. And so you talk about that. You make sure that it's relevant to the skill set of this person. So you're not coaching them uh, over, uh, you know, a task that was way beyond their ability to, to do it from a training perspective that they would feel very lost if you talk about that because then they, they can't fix it since they don't know what to do. But you want to be specific. You want to make sure that you, you walk through exactly what happened, what the expectations were, and what can be done to remedy the situation. A lot of times when it comes to coaching, when someone makes a mistake, those are great learning opportunities. People learn a lot with their mistakes. And the key to this is they got to own it. So uh, mistakes are great learning opportunities. So you, you, all, you also make sure that you tell them what has to change. If you do it this way, it ends up not being such a negative interaction because it's specific. You give them action items to do different things differently going forward. But it's really out of a sense of concern versus I'm mad at you. I don't appreciate what you did because that's really when you're talking to people about mistakes, typically these employees are scared anyway. So you don't have to worry about exploding into a conflict in most cases. All right. The other thing is that coaching is interactive and it's not you did it wrong. Shame on you. You need to do it right. That's not what coaching is. Coaching is you, you discuss. So you might say to the, to the, to me, you might say, what, what do you think happened in this situation? And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I might be in a little trouble. And I tell you now, you know, most of the time I'm pretty honest and sometimes I'm not, but, but uh, it's really more of a, 
here's what I saw happen. And then I listen as the coach, I'm going to listen to say, where did the mistake happen in the way they thought it through? And you don't tell them anything it's because telling is not going to create the insight that they need to change their behavior. All right. So what you're going to do instead of tell is you're going to ask questions, even though you know what the answer is, you're going to ask questions. So tell me, how, okay, so this happened and you're thinking, okay, so he alienated a client or a customer. So what did you say? What did the customer say? How did the customer react? You, know, you ask questions to help the employee through a, a realization that that wasn't the right path to go. All right. Because asking questions is different from telling on so many levels. You can, it, it forces the employee to think about what happened. And eventually, if you ask the question, you're peeling the onion away as to what happened, what happened, why, why, why. And then in that moment, they will see that, they, that there was a flaw in the way they were thinking from the get go that maybe a client isn't as important. Maybe I'm too busy and I shouldn't care about the client, something like that. But you'll hear the flaw in their thinking if you ask the right questions. Once you get to the point where they admit or you they realize that they made an error, get a commitment from them that they understood that it's an error and that it, that the behavior needs to change. Now, why is that? Well, if you if they if you said you made a mistake, don't do that again or else you don't know if they're going to commit to doing it differently in the future. Again, your goal is to get the insight inside their heads to make the change. So what you want to get is for them to own the mistake. That's the best case scenario. I own it. And here's now here's what, then you ask the next question of what are you going to do going forward to prevent it from happening again and let them walk through that because that's the commitment you're getting from them on exactly how they can prevent the, this kind of error from happening again. And really, the most important thing in these discussions is to listen to what they're saying. Uh, don't try and jump ahead to get to setting them up to where they, they, they made a mistake and, and say, aha, you did it wrong. You just want to you just want to sit back and listen to where they're coming from so that they understand what they did wrong. Also, I would say, you know, pay attention to the body language, because, you know, if I'm sitting like this and I'm looking away from you, I may not be as open. Uh, you know, with you about uh, listening to what's happening. Does it indicate, you know, that does the body language show that the employee is open to your guidance? If they get very defensive, it might mean to take a stop in your coaching process and come back a bit again later uh, because they may not want to listen. You know, when, when people are under stress, we only listen to bits and pieces of things. But what's important for them to understand is they have to hear what's what needs to change. So pay attention to the body language. And if you are sitting across a big desk, you know, where they're on one side and you're on the other, keep in mind that that will have some, that will inhibit the employer from being open from you. So the best thing for a human being when you want to have these conversations is to sit adjacent, uh, you know, sit 90 degrees from that person or sit, you know, in a chair in front of them, not too close, but, you know, in front of them. So that there are no barriers to discussion. It makes people as human beings open up a little more. So how you place the, 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 during the coaching conversation is really important. And I want to say that coaching, if you do coaching right, it really is critical to achieve success. And I actually, my, 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 my biggest successful coaching uh, situation was with a very angry person at a restaurant. And I don't know why we did this at a restaurant, but um, this, this woman had very, uh, she had interpersonal issues with, with managers in particular, certain male managers, I would say. Um, and, and she was coming across as extremely uh, angry and, and kind of a gotcha mode. And I had to coach her. I had to coach her to stop doing that. And it was so hard to do. And she insisted on having dinner. And so when we went through, I was asking the questions, you know, and she would ask the questions and we'd go deeper and deeper into seeing the flaw in her thinking. And her eyes would get bigger and people in the restaurant would kind of leave because uh, they just they could tell the conversation was getting tense. Um, but eventually she, she did answer the question when I, you know, she did realize that what was happening was she, she was very unhappy working with these managers and she was angry about, um, just the, their philosophies and just the business philosophies. And so what ended up happening was she decided she just couldn't do the job anymore and she quit the next day. I, I didn't expect that. Uh, I was hoping that she would see that, it, you know, it's 
better to change the behavior and, and, and not see the, uh, the managers as the enemies. But the insight that she received was, yeah, I really hate doing this and I don't want to do this anymore. And, you know, I know you're not going to let me do this anymore. I can't be angry with the managers. But that was an interesting coaching uh, scenario where I kept asking the questions and we got to the root cause, which was she really hated being there among these people. So coaching guidelines, um, you know, your role is um, very important here in terms of doing good coaching. You got to observe the work directly. So what really makes people mad is that they uh, they might say a manager might say, well, you know, this guy heard you say this in the office the other day. And that's very inappropriate. Don't appreciate that. Uh, you know, that that feels like a gossipy comment if it comes out that way. So if possible, if someone comes and says this employee is done, if it's not egregious or completely out of line, um, you know, do your best to observe the work directly because it's much more constructive feedback. And I would demonstrate concern. Uh, you know, if you said you did it wrong and you know you're doing the, the parent waving in the finger in your, your mind, actually, you know, that you did it, that they did it wrong. That's really an adversarial way to talk to someone and you're not going to get them to want to understand what they did wrong. So, you know, you can demonstrate concern. We, I, I always assume when someone is struggling with the job that they're doing the best they can with what they know, but something is holding them back. It could be their own mindset that it's everybody's fault that they can't get it done or you know, something is going on in their personal life. But if I show concern and I can better understand by asking them how they are, you know, what's really going on here, what's holding them back? And I think if you wanna really get, uh, if you wanna really see behavior turn around, you gotta build the relationships, not only with employees that are uh, struggling, but also with the good employees, because you know, when you're going through these difficult times with employees, if you have to coach a poor performer, uh, other people are watching this very closely and they wonder, are you going to treat me fairly if this ever happens? So it's really important for you to, to build that relationship based on trust before anything bad happens. And I think the other thing is if you collaborate. So collaboration is a tough one. You know, barking orders and telling people what to do will not give people the insight that they have to uh, change other than they'll follow it maliciously and they might even do some things that can hurt the business if you take it that approach. Collaboration is a gold standard for leadership and that you partner with employees. And in fact, your younger workers demand this. They want to partner with you to say, how should the job be done? How should things work? And so a collaboration means that you sit down with them and partner with them on that performance to find out what it's gonna to take to make them meet or exceed expectations. And then you also identify and provide the challenges that are there. And, and, and your coach, you know, even as a great employee, all of us are works in progress. So why not tell a great employee, you know, some other things they can work on to even get better? Um, we all like that. I think it's boring uh, if you have a great employee to sit there and just do the same thing over and over again. So as a great coach, you're always looking for even better performance or great performance. So not only will you identify challenges, but you can provide them to your workers as well. And then I, I would say, you know, you want to create a positive work environment through accountability. The best environments, the highest performing teams around are the ones where people own their mistakes and fix them. Um, and, and, and people feel a sense of ownership in the company's success. And so that accountability mindset is a cultural norm that great coaches have where people really in, sincerely own the success of the company because they care. And that's really comes from great coaching. All right, so I'm going to talk about some other things about coaching. So ideally, the gold standard would be your top performers. You know, you got and this is like a what we call a bell curve. The top 10% are high performing. Most people meeting expectations are around 80%, and the bottom performers are around 10%. But where do you think supervisors spend a majority of their time? I would bet you that they spend 70 to 80% of their time dealing with the bottom 10%. Now, why is that? Well, because there's the discipline issue and the documentation they have to do. It might be they have to track attendance. Um, they might have to have people covering for someone else who's not there or not meeting expectations. Uh, you know, and so you find that everybody else is ignored pretty much because there's so much attention paid to these small, this, this small group of people. And the top 10 percent, I would say in most cases in these situations where there's a lot of attention paid to the poor performers, the top 10% are completely ignored. And they're good enough. So I'm going to give you some pointers on how you coach each level, the top performers, the average performers, and, and the poor performers. 
So the t- and, and this is the thing that uh, top performers will tell you is they're typically not even paid attention to. Uh, you know, they might get an occasional positive reinforcement, but because they're so good, you don't really have to worry about them. They, you know, they they're there. They get the job done, and it's all good. But they can do a lot of things to help you. One is that they can mentor. Um, top performers have a lot of knowledge and skill that they could share with other workers that, you know, if you have a new employee, you could partner them with one of these high performing employees. They're the kinds of employees that set examples to the team. The other thing you can do is to provide a lot of feedback and feedback could be just positive reinforcement. Hey, I think you're doing great. I appreciate what you did with this project today. It really made a difference. Hey, you know, you've got the skill set. Can you share it with others? Um, just just talking to them about how things are going, they will appreciate greatly. I'm um, also being specific, you know, hey, you're doing a great job. It feels nice. But if you say, hey, you're doing a great job with that project yesterday, you got it done before the deadline. I really appreciate all the hard work you did there. Thank you so much. That means more to employees. And you also can also try, you can ask these top performing employees for input on processes, problems, things that the business needs help with. You know, these are the untapped resources in many businesses that they don't go to to say, hey, I've got a problem with this this process or system. I don't know what to do. They may have the answer for you. So these are the people you can ask for input to. Um, The other thing is they want to be challenged, especially your younger top performers expect to be challenged. So what does challenge look like? Does it look like more responsibility? Do you give them some projects that they haven't done before? Do you ask them to innovate uh, or solve a problem? Um, some things that keep them challenged where they feel like they're doing more than just a standard job. And I would recognize them. I would recognize them for all the good work that they do. Uh, they are examples to be followed. Um, and, you know, some of the things that you could do that that can help them feel recognized would be raises. Of course, that's like, oh, sure, that's easy. Ha! Uh, bonuses or promotions. I would say a lot of these high-performing employees could probably get promoted. Um, you could increase their responsibility to something that they want to do. You could give them an opportunity to learn new skills and technologies. Um, You could ask them to specialize in a certain area if they're really that good. Um, You could recognize them publicly in staff meetings uh, or through some kind of uh, company communication. You could give them certificates. These little things, I I see them in workstations a lot where there's certificates for great performance or accommodation letters to put in their employee files. That means a lot to these employees and they really appreciate that. So on to our average performers. These are the, this is the this is the 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 blood of the of the company. These are the people that get the job done. They're not you know super duper, but they're most of your employees that are doing their work, not asking for a lot, just just getting stuff done. So how can you coach and motivate these people? Well, what you can do is to determine their capability of doing the job. In other words, you look at what their expectations are and say, do they match? Is there a gap? If there's a gap, how can we work with you know, those gaps to make them uh, even better employees. The other thing is identify the whys. So why are they average? Why aren't they exceeding expectations? Uh, is it because in many cases, it could be because in lifestyle, they might be having a, either a second job or they might be too busy at home with family. Um, there might be reasons why they're totally OK with being in this place where they're doing the job, coming in, getting it done and going home. And, and in many cases, that's what you want. That's what they want. It's not a bad thing at all. Um, and always reinforce their strengths. I think that in many cultures, uh, you know, it, it's a, there's a tendency for managers who don't recognize to only reinforce the negative, to go to the people who are not meeting expectations and talk to them. But yet, as I said before, positive reinforcement, there's never enough of that. So, you know, reinforce the strengths for these people. Give them kudos for getting good work done. Uh, again, these people sit at their jobs, doing the jobs all day. We don't, they typically don't get a lot of discussion about how they're performing. So, you know, reinforce when they're doing a good job, reinforce those strengths so that they, they feel that you've acknowledged them in a good way. Um, if, if you're not sure that they are, um, they have the att- ability, if you think they have the ability to grow into top performing employees, you might want to clarify their expectations. Uh, make sure that they understand what's expected out of them, see what can challenge them more, what kind of additional training they need. And I would develop a performance plan. In fact, I'm an advocate for every employee should have some kind of a career development plan if you want to retain them. And the reason is, number one, your younger workers demand it. The millennials and Gen Zs demand career development. It's not hard for you to do. It doesn't cost a small fortune. And what you can do is uh, have a, you know, have a conversation of what they want to do with their lives. 
What can the company do to support them in getting, do they want to get a college degree? Do they want to move into a deeper skill in, in the job that they're in? Um, what is it they'd like to do? But having that conversation is very motivational and, and people can't get enough of it. So a development plan is a good thing. And you can even have one page document. We have forms out there that you can use uh, that, you know, to say, this is what a plan looks like. It could be read a book, you know, it's that simple. And then, of course, identify training. If they need some special training, um, if, if and I know this happens with average workers, it could be a training, a new technology that they have to learn. Um, it's very important that you take the time to give them that training. And so just to summarize with these folks, let them know that you think they're capable, valuable employees and that they have the potential to do even better. And they get into specifics on how they can improve their performance. You want to clarify their standards? And you want to work with them in coaching sessions to develop a, a plan, a, a development plan to make them grow. All right, now we're going to move to the next group. That's the hardest group to manage, the poor performers. Uh, so let's focus on these, these issues here. Um, focus on accountability with these folks. What gets people in trouble a lot of times is that they are pointing the finger at everyone else but themselves. They are not owning the, the, the issues. Uh, and so if I've coached you, and you're still not changing your behavior, the problem is you don't believe that you're accountable. So that's where we have to start because once they're accountable, they can change. There's, there's room for them to grow. I, you got to make sure you utilize the prior coaching or performance reviews, or, or in other words, document any prior discussions. Um, that's really important legally. Um, so if someone ends up being terminated eventually, uh, you know, they're, and, 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 and they go to an agency, or unemployment and say, you didn't fire me for the right reasons. There were illegal reasons. You've got to have documentation to back it up. Additionally, it's also very constructive feedback. If you say, I talked to you uh, last week at um, Wednesday about the same issue, and I still don't see things changing. It's much more constructive. Um, also, you want to identify the prior commitments that, that they made to you. Um, you know, you committed to being on time uh, starting um, last Wednesday. I seen you late Friday and again on Monday and again on Tuesday. Uh, that's an issue to me. So you want to identify those commitments that they made to you. This should be a two-way conversation. And I know this is hard to do. A two-way conversation is, do you understand? Okay, here's what the issue is I have with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? They answer. Do you understand what the consequences are? They answer. So it's not, you did it wrong. Shame on you. I'm going to go ahead and fire if you don't change your ways. That's not how it goes if you want people to change or if you want to protect the company from potential lawsuits. What you want to do is have a conversation with questions. Why does this continue to happen? What's holding you back from understanding what needs to be done? It's a whole different mindset when you're talking to people who are struggling. Uh, you have to, if you're really a good coach, you get the employee to think of the solutions themselves with your guidance because that forces accountability. So if they're going to, if they're going to look at the solutions, maybe they'll change. You know, so, so a, a solution orientation versus this is bad, this is bad, this is bad is much better for this person who's struggling. And you might need to renegotiate the goals and performance. You know, if they if they need training because they don't fully understand a process, fine. Um, you might need to change your schedule if they can't come in at 8 o'clock. I mean, you just have to think holistically about what can you do aside from firing them that could help them be successful. And then agree to a plan. So, you know, you, you they may never agree, but you say, this is <laughs> this is what I expect out of you as part of the job. You know, can you get it done? Can you come in on time tomorrow? That's what I expect you to do. And the reason why this conversation is so important is that it ties into the world of reasonableness, which legally is the best protection for a company from legal claims, like lawsuits from um, uh, an employee or a, an agency, the EEOC or, or the Department of Regulatory Agencies calling you to say you were discriminatory. The best thing you could do is to come up with a way to help that employee be successful, even though in the face of it, it looks like they're not going to make it. You got to keep trying. And then schedule frequent follow-up sessions. One of the things I have found with supervisors is that when they're dealing with a poor performing employee, the first thing they want to do is run out the door and avoid them at all costs after they tell them they're doing a poor job. Again, it's conflict avoidance. But what needs to happen is you got to make sure the employee understands that they're accountable to you and that you're going to meet them again next week to check in to make sure things are happening the way they need to. Now, what happens if you get to a point where the employee is not meeting expectations, you give them a final written warning or a written warning, you're about to fire them. 
my advice is, and this is very good legal advice that I've gotten from attorneys as well, is to do a check-in after 24 hours after doing a uh, final written warning. And this is the ultimate coaching opportunity here. All right. It's how are you? And I've had people cry when I asked that question after they had a very difficult discussion the day before about their performance and they're not meeting expectations. And in their minds, they're thinking, I'm just going to get, I'm going to get fired. Okay. Um, do you understand what we discussed yesterday? And the reason this is so important is because um, a lot of times when people are getting bad news and we're all this way as human beings, we hear bits and pieces of what was said. You know, and we might even get a written document. We won't look at it because it's just too difficult to look at. So the next day after I process this is the best time to reiterate what's really important about what was discussed yesterday. If you didn't remember, tell me what you remember about it. And they have bits and pieces. You say, all right, let's go through this again. And here are the issues. Here are the solutions. Here's what you need to do. All right. So you, now you're, you're just trying to connect the communication. The key facts about the, the written warning that they have to understand is really important here. And this is not adversarial, by the way. You're trying to help them. And then you say, how can we help you overcome this issue? This is a crazy question because, you know, in the mind of the super of the uh, uh, employers, you're saying, I've given them every chance possible. Why would I ask them that question? Well, because it's the best legal question you could possibly ask. Because if you if they go to a lawsuit and you're deposed and they say you were just, you know, you were just an angry manager who just arbitrarily fired them. And you say, no, I have this uh, document, a conversation. We come this and they had no answer. Well, gosh, that's reasonable. That's absolutely reasonable. So it, it shows that you're not an angry supervisor. You're not trying to boot them out. You were trying to help them right up to the very end. You were trying to help them. So overcoming. And the funny thing is, when I've asked people this question, only once did I get an answer over the, the 38 years I've been in it was, I need more training, which we provided them. But more often than not, people have no idea how to answer that question when they're at this point. And I say to them, you have three choices. Okay? You can decide this job is not a good fit and resign. You can decide the issue is out of your control. You know what we're going to do. We're going to terminate you. Or you can decide to overcome the issue, the issues and, and listen to what the manager's saying, listen to what I'm saying, and overcome the issues. You get to decide. Now, what does this do to someone? This means that the employee is confronted with they've been making bad choices all along, and now they have to face up to that. And you document this because chances are this person will be terminated. But sometimes people get, they turn it around. But this is the reason for this particular conversation is the ultimate coaching conversation to say, as we as a company want you to be successful, choice not to be. So just a quick recap. It's really important for you to take the time to, let's see, I'm just go here. Understand, listen, listen to your folks when you're coaching. You know, you might even be frustrated or angry. You might want to give yourself a little bit of time to process that emotion. But listening is really important when you're coaching. If you're not listening, you're, you're, you're directing. So that that piece, and if you, it's hard for you to listen, actively listen, all right? You and, and then make sure that employees learn something when they make mistakes. There's lots of lessons to be learned where none of us are perfect. And so if an employee recognizes, you know, that they made a mistake, that's half the problem. They, the chances are much lower that they'll make that mistake again if they recognize that. And if they do, be encouraging to them. You know, help people understand that it's going to be okay. That, you know, once if they never do it again, it's all going to be good. And then when things happen that are really good, celebrate them. You know, when people achieve things, celebrate. Because that creates a culture where high performance is embraced and celebrated. What coaching is not, you're not judging. You're not telling you have to take the time to listen and talk to this person so it's not impatient and you can't rush through this stuff. If you don't have the time, let me just say this to summarize. If you don't have the time to coach, you're going to spend more money on high turnover. So I would say to every leader who's in on this, this webinar, it's really important for you to take the time to coach these people because they're all wanting it. They all need it. And you can actually tap into some great high performance moments in the future if you take the time. For those of you that do it, I know that you really enjoy doing it, it's, it's, aside from the, the bad performance. But when you're talking to great employees, it's really fun to coach them because they grow. So with that, uh, if, there, if there are any questions on the chat, uh, just let me know. Let's see if I can find the chat. 
not here. Any questions, comments? Well, thanks to all of you. We're at the top of the hour. I really appreciate your time. Get out there and coach. <laughs>